All right, so I'm Robert Heath. This is uh, lecture number 17, the Wireless Communications Lab. So this week, um, we're going to spend uh, two lectures talking about some different standards. And today, I have selected the GSM standard to discuss. And so the lecture is entitled Decoding the GSM Standard. And so you should be able to explain some of the basic components of GSM and justify the framing and slot structure. So I'm going to upload some slides that I found online that I think provide a good overview of GSM, but there's not any um, chapter in the textbook on this topic here. The other material that is related for the lecture today is these two uh, standards documents that I put on Blackboard already. Um, this is Etsy. 100, 573, and Etsy TS 100, 959. And if you have a um, computer with you, you might want to refer to them during the lecture today even. So let's start off with um, a bit of just background about uh, GSM itself. And so I'm going to start off by you know, reviewing some of the GSM concepts here. And then we're going to start going through this um, standard document and looking at different interesting elements here. So GSM itself, it nowadays stands for Global System for Mobile Communication. So it's a cellular communication standard. So the GSM comes from this here. And it used to mean uh, Group Special Mobile. It, it was actually started with a French name. And then they, at some point, converted it over to this, this English version, which doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Um, so what exactly is it here? So GSM is a second generation cellular standard. And it has, um, so as, a, as a cellular system, you know, it's, it's designed for mobile uh, telephony as well as, to some extent, supports um, data communication. And since it's second generation, its mission was to replace analog um, cellular systems that were deployed in the 80s. And so its development um, started in the 80s, and it was completed in 1990. So GSM was released in phases. And so essentially, each phase had um, a certain set of technology, and then subsequent phases added additional features. And so the phase one, which was released in 1990, had uh, support for basic voice service. And then phase two, released in 1993, added SMS, fax, and more support for data. And then what you might think was obviously phase three, no, it's phase two plus, is the evolution of GSM, which is called EDGE. And that added um, actually another modulation technique and higher data rates and as well as other features. And then after these phase one, phase two, and phase two plus, so phase two plus was not called phase three because this was happening right around the development of 3G, the third generation wireless systems. So they didn't want to call it phase three because it wasn't going to be a 3G cellular standard. So the standard after GSM was um, wideband CDMA, and then that became uh, essentially the evolution of GSM, and then that was also uh, released in several different phases. Um, we're going to talk about GSM, even though it's a bit older, because it's um, a time division multiple access TDMA. It uses a TDMA um, kind of waveform, which is similar to a lot of what we've talked about at the beginning of class. Um, the 3G standard 
the OMTS standards based on wideband CDMA, which is a, another kind of multiple access, is something we haven't really discussed in class. And then um, LTE Advanced uses an OFDM type waveform that we're going to talk about with 802.11a. So, so this structure, I guess it, it matches a bit several of the concepts that we, we talk about. Now, um, so there's like kind of a lot of background in the standard itself. So one of the things is that since this was created in the 80s and then released in 1990, the GSM standard specifies um, every aspect of the entire network. So it doesn't just specify the physical layer or, you know, the training. I mean, it specifies literally everything in, in the entire network. And they have this um, very peculiar set of, of terminology that's used I suppose you get used to it, it, it all makes sense, but it, it, it's a little bit peculiar for me. The, um, the few that, that are probably rather familiar, there's this notion of MS, which is mobile station. And then, so they label, like generally these pieces of, of equipment, and then they also label the connections between the different pieces of equipment that they call interfaces here. So the mobile station might connect to a BTS, which is a base transceiver station or base station. So these are the two that are perhaps most common. Now what might not be so common is that um, the mobile station communicates with the base station over the U sub M link. So this is the name for the um, communication link between these two entities here. The base transceiver stations, several of them are connected together and networked to a base um, station switching center, a base switching center, BSC. And this together forms the base station subsystem. So that would be like this block here. And then the space um, switching center connects using this interface here is called ABIS. This is the A interface. It connects to a mobile switching center, which is called an MSC. And then um, various sundry other components here. There's a VLR, visitor location registry, there's a home location registry, there's a gateway, it just kind of goes on and on and on. All of these interfaces here have names, many of those which I forget at this point here. Um, the home location registry stores subscriber specific information, like your uh, information related to your IMEI number attached to your phone, billing information. The visitor lo location register here, when you go and you're roaming on someone else's network, they essentially cache information from the HLR of your home cellular system in this here. And so this helps, you know, the roaming cellular network figure out how to bill you for the services that you're paying for. There was apparently many years where this whole connection between the VLR and the HLR wasn't working and roaming was actually free. This is what I heard in the early, early 90s. Um, sadly, that's not the case anymore. Now we get gouged for roaming. Um, so this is, you know, th this is a small snapshot of what is um, potentially a tremendously complicated looking block diagram. Each of these pieces here has associated with it, um, you know, one or more documents that describe its interaction here. So this is describing a protocol for communication. This is describing set of protocols. You know, this UM describes set of protocol, physical layer, higher layer. Um, and so together, when you look at what's required to standardize this entire network here, you end up with, um, you know, probably a several bookcases of uh, standards that if you printed them all out, would take up like the whole wall here. You know, so this is, this is tens of thousands of pages of documentation that was developed through this collaborative effort here. Now, cellular systems since then have, have gone a slightly different direction and have 
decided to replace a lot of these specialized interfaces with you know things like IP and, and have tried to make the network a little less specialized. But anyway, so GSM is is an incredibly sophisticated and detailed um, communication standard. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about um, two things. The, the we're going to talk about the physical layer, like the modulation that it uses, the training how it performs carrier frequency offset estimation. And we're also going to talk about the framing structure. And so this is going to tell us how bits or binary information is mapped into this hierarchy of, of um, structure that's used in the transmit um, and receive waveforms here. So that, that'll become more clear in a moment here. But that's the, what we're going to focus on here. And I just wanted to, to give you a little bit of a perspective on you know, just how immense and complicated the, the standard is. I mean, there's, there's thick phone books of um, textbooks just on GSM itself. And this is sort of a fun lecture because even though I've, I've done it several times, every time I look at the standard, I learn something new. I mean, there's just so much information contained in there. Um, it's pretty interesting. So that's um, a bit of background here. Now, this lecture in some sense is going to be like a fire hose of information, so... If you want more detail about something, you should stop me and ask. Don't wait till the end, because there will basically be no time left at the end. All right. Um, so now we'll start talking about, let's see, one of these documents here. So first off, just a little bit of background here. So let's, let's start off with the document um, 5. Yeah, this is... Let's see here, TS-100-573. So this is an example of a technical specification. Um, what you can see up here is, first of all, the specification is being published by um, Etsy, which is, um, it's a good question what Etsy stands for here. Let's see. I suppose I should know this already here. I can't remember now. Hmm. Okay. I want to say it's something like European Telecommunication Standard something, but I don't remember what the I is. Um, Etsy is a place you can go here, www.etsy.org. They publish all of these standards, and publish means that they're, they're cataloging all of their different versions. And you can go onto this website, you can search, for example, for this document number, and then you can be presented with this particular document, or um, older versions, or newer versions. So the interesting points here to note, so Etsy, technical standard, that's what the TS is for. And then there's 100.573. These things mean something in how they're categorizing the GSM standards here. Um, that I don't know. The V is version number, and then this is 8 is the major number. So this is like major change, minor super minor. So version 8.9.0 is the version of this document. In 2004-11, this is the date. This is, this is November 2004. Now, if you go in there, you'll find they don't have, you know, 8.8, 8.7. Several key um, different versions in there. So there's probably about 10 of them. What happens is these documents would be be edited and, and approved at different meetings. And so typically, each of these version numbers is associated with the outcome of a, of a particular standards meeting. So people would get together. You know, they talk about some change that needed to be made. They'd, through some voting mechanism, they'd agree on that. And then um, that would become part of the new document. So end up doing this. It ends up in one of these. And there's actually a whole bunch of arguing and discussion, kind of like um, find in like a, the legal world. And a lot of times, you know, arguing over grammar and specific words. It's kind of funny. Um, not a lot of professors are involved in that. It's very tedious. Um, so this is um, now. Let's let's get looking further down here. So digital cellular telecommunication system phase two plus. So this document describes um, 
uh, Edge, and Edge is backward compatible with GSM. So it's going to include the features that were in the original GSM standard plus some of the newer features. And the, so this is like the, the sort of the category here. This is the topic, physical layer on the radio path, general description. So this is just going to tell us a little bit about the physical layer. And then this is um, 3GPP TS 05.01. This is the numbering that they used, TS is still technical standard, before um, you know, GSM essentially got absorbed into 3GPP. And so I actually remember more of the standards with these numbers here. Like 05 was like related to physical layer, and 01 was like the basic version of the physical layer standard. So to me, it had somehow more meaning. But you know, if someone here can tell us how to decode these numbers, then it probably has meaning too. Other things here you can see, this is the GSM logo. This is 3GPP because GSM essentially got absorbed into 3GPP. And 3GPP is the evolution of GSM, and then that's the FC logo there. So things to look at here. Well, let's skip the copyright notification. There's no copyright issue since we're using this um, as a training exercise, of course. So, you know, I encourage you to flip through this document um, that I've posted on Blackboard. Um, I've highlighted various things in the document just that I find interesting. So one of them here is intellectual property rights, or IPR for short. And IPR ends up being as also IP, IPRs or IP. Um, so usually when wireless engineers are talking about IP, they're not talking about internet protocol. They're talking about intellectual property or patents. And when the standard is made, you know, companies come together and try to, to you know, come. I mean, the, the actual objective would be to, to come up with some kind of a, a wireless system that meets a set of objectives, you know, that wants to be, it's very low power, it provides coverage for everybody, and, you know, so that's kind of like a high level objectives. And then there's typically more detailed technical objectives that meet in there, you know, like it has to support this this kind of a data rate and this kind of a voice modulation technique. And then um, once you get through just like those basic requirements, then um, the companies have a lot of freedom to suggest solutions that meet those requirements, you know. And so the typical, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how to express this without being completely jaded, but um, I mean, basically, if you're a company, you know, what you want is for your idea to get incorporated into the standard because your idea has presumably been, um, you know, is under, is under patent protection or you filed a patent for it or you filed a provisional patent for it or, you know, there's, there's something pending somewhere. And if your um, intellectual property ends up being incorporated in the standard, that means that, um, you know, for the hundreds of millions of units that are sold, you get some piece of that money. Now, not, not a lot maybe, you know, but even a penny times 100 million, that's a reasonable amount of money there. So uh, companies spend a lot of effort to get their ideas incorporated to the standard. Now, if there's a lot of companies, and so then everybody you know, knows that everyone is doing this, and so why would anybody agree to that, right? It doesn't make any sense. Well, because everybody wants some intellectual property in the standard, and so companies then will get together, you know, okay, you vote for mine, I vote for yours, that kind of deal. And they form coalitions, and companies form partnerships where they cross-license each other's intellectual property. So anyways, this, it's a big deal. Um, it's a major way that, that companies you know, can make money in the wireless industry. So one of the interesting things here is that, um, you know, so, so IPR is essential or potentially essential. So these are ones that are really related to what's in the standard, not just something that, you know, is, one could argue is related, but something that's like very, very related may have been declared to Etsy, but, um, and so you can find this online, but pursuant to Etsy IPR policy, no investigation including IPR searches has been carried out by Etsy. No guarantee can be given as to the existence of other IPRs not referenced, which are or may be or may become essential to the present document. This means that someone may have a patent that they didn't tell Etsy about, Etsy doesn't know about, Etsy doesn't have any, um, is not going to look for that patent. It doesn't guarantee there is no such patent. So basically, someone could come with a patent and sue anybody who implements what's described in here. You know, so don't think that if you build a radio that matches the standard that, that, that you're done. No. If you build a radio that matches the standard, then you have to figure out whose intellectual property you need to license as part of that radio. And what they're saying here is that, by the way, 
There may be other intellectual property that you didn't think about that you also have to license. And so then companies come along, some of them very small companies that essentially just consist of a, a few lawyers and a patent, and then go and try to extort, or let's see, um, license money from larger companies. And then that creates um, a lot of litigation that happens in Texas. About half of all of these cases are tried in, in Texas, and they you know, employ a lot of uh, UT faculty to serve as expert witnesses on, on said cases here. <laughs> it's a good side business, apparently. So intellectual property is a big deal here. Now, let's look at the, the scope here of this. this. This is the table of contents. So it's always useful to go through the table of contents. You know, there's the forward, two of them apparently. And so there's going to be something about the set of channels, the block structure, the multiple access and time slot structure. So the things that you really need to go through carefully is going to be this, what I've highlighted here, 9 through 15, these pages here. And there's going to be a lot of information about coding and interleaving that you know, you'd be a little bit familiar with, but you don't have to know the details there. So let's keep going here. That's three. Let's find. All right, so let's review um, the second part of the forward here. So this is, oh, just a little bit of background on the versioning here. Okay, I thought I had that somewhere here. So the first digit, X, one, presented for information, two, presented for approval, three, or greater, indicates approved document under change control. Second digit is incremented for all changes of substance, technical enhancements, corrections, updates. The third digit is incremented when editorial-only changes have been incorporated. So suppose if you just change the grammar, you can update Z. And if you update something that maybe changes like an equation or some more technical description, you have to update Y. And then I suppose they increment X after a certain number of updates to, to Y. So there's um, a, a set of references in this document here. So these are references to other different standards here. And they're using the old uh, notation here and then the, the titles. But if you search on the Etsy standard, you search for like TS01.04 on Etsy.org, you'll find this standard here. And it's a sundry versions. So let's keep going here. Let's see. Okay, so the radio subsystem provides a certain number of logical channels. So a logical channel is not necessarily like a physical channel, a carrier frequency. A logical channel is, is there for, I don't know, logical purposes here. There's two main channels in GSM. The first is called a traffic channel, and these um, carry speech and data information. So in GSM, they use this... Um, notation TCH to refer to traffic channel. That's, that's traffic channel. And then there are many different types of traffic channels that are called TCH slash something or ETCH and so on here. So these are different kinds of channels here. Um, you know, we don't have to know all of the details of this for the course. The ones that are worth looking at, for example, full rate speech, this is kind of the standard speech traffic channel. There's a half rate speech. There's an enhanced full rate speech. This one uses a better vocoder to get better quality. Half rate speech uses half of the number of bursts as the full rate. It gives better, um, supports more users. And, you know, there's different um, data channels as well here. So each of these channels will be associated with certain physical parameters, certain vocoder rate, coding, modulation technique. Modulation is fixed for most of them here. The other channels here are called signaling channels. And these channels are used to convey information to the mobile station that um, essentially helps them perform all operations. You know, so for example, you might need to know what carrier frequency that you need to tune your radio to to demodulate your signal. You might need to know where to listen to correct your frequency offset. So a lot of these parameters, this is related to like a lot of the networking aspects of cellular systems that, that we don't discuss um, much in the class. Now, let's look at, um, so I can, you know, channels continues on. Reference configuration, I'll skip here. 
So let's get, get into the um, multiple access and time slot structure. So GSM is a, it uses as a multiple access technique what's a combination of time division and frequency division multiple access. So essentially, multiple access strategy is a way of sharing spectrum among many users. And, and so the way that, that GSM works is that there's um, different carrier frequencies in a cell. Each of these carrier frequencies is associated with a signal that has a bandwidth of about 200 kilohertz. And on these different carriers, there's a temporal block structure that in this example we'll see has little blocks in it that are called bursts that go from 1 to 8. And then they repeat. And so if you are um, allocated a, um, a channel in GSM, you would be assigned a, a frequency and then also an index here. And so your information would be communicated every, you know, every time this one comes around here. So you'd be sending your information here. And so this is a way for eight users to share the same spectrum here. Now, of course, eight users each get one-eighth of the pie. There's no, um, you know, there's no magic here in this here. It's just a way of dividing up resources among different users. Uh, so this is called uh, TDMA. And then time division multiple access. And then assigning users on different subcarriers is called frequency division multiple access. So there's a combination of frequency division and time division here. Now, another thing that's worth mentioning is that there's this notion in cellular of uplink and downlink. So if you think about this in the old days where base stations were really high up, the downlink is like the bits falling like a waterfall from the base station to the mobile. That's the downlink. And then this is the uplink here. And so in, in GSM, to separate the uplink and downlink, it uses what's called frequency division duplexing. Or FDD. And so your downlink carrier, suppose your downlink carrier was F1, then your uplink carrier would be some other frequency, F1 prime, which in GSM it's, um, it's something like F1 plus 45 megahertz. It might be minus, I forget which is the, the base one here. But so essentially when you're assigned for your uh, you know, this, this, is, this is when you're you know, actively communicating with the base station. When you're assigned a particular frequency on the, on the downlink, it comes paired with an uplink frequency that, that you can use there. And then there's a couple other tricky things as well. Like when you demodulate your um, packet on the uplink, the uplink framing ends up being slightly different than the downlink framing. So if the uplink frame is like this, one, two, and so on here to eight, the uplink would start here. One, two, et cetera here. And so what that means is that at some point in the time, you would be, let's say, listening on the downlink at frame one. And then some other point of the time, you would be communicating information on the uplink during this slot one here. And then you're also left with other time where the radio is potentially unoccupied and is engaged in other functions here. So that's just a little bit of the terminology here. Now, let's look at the, um, first of all, the high-level structure of the standard, the framing structure here. So what happens is, you know, we, we have this, this unit right here, which is called a burst. And these eight bursts here are called, I think it's a slot... Yeah, it's a slot. And these are grouped together and interleaved with other control type information. So there's actually a structure associated with this set of bursts here. It doesn't exactly um, repeat like I've shown you here. 
And so that structure is captured in this um, diagram here, which is um, shown here. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to zoom in first on this piece here. Okay, so this is the, you know, important terminology here. So first of all, here is the um, one TDMA frame with eight time slots. So these are the time slots that I was trying to draw on that previous sheet here. Now we'll talk about the contents of that momentarily here. But essentially, each of these um, time slots here, it consists of 156.25 symbols, and one symbol, because it is um, 3.69 microseconds long, so the whole duration of a time slot is a little more than half a millisecond here. And then multiplying that by 8, you get that the whole time slot here is about 4.6 milliseconds. Now, the, um, these are organized into two different categories here. So for um, data and voice, the TDMA frame gets organized into this, what's called a 26-frame multi-frame. So essentially here, there's 26 of these in a row here. And then these multi-frames are organized up here into a, um, let's see here, this is a super frame. Super frame is of duration 6 seconds. So this thing is 120 milliseconds. Now, in the organization here, what will happen is two of these TDMA frames will be replaced with control information. So it's not the same thing happening 26 times. It'll be like 24 occurrences of, let's say, voice data and two of control signaling. And there's this part of the complexity of the standard that I don't know if I can <laughs> explain right now. So these multi-frames get put in together in a super frame of length six seconds. This super frame gets stuck into this gigantic hyperframe of length 3 hours and 28 minutes. Now that seems pretty ridiculous to have a frame length of 3 hours on something. But this relates to some of the security parameters that are repeated only every, you know, roughly 3 hours. Why there's all of this structure here is that, um, and, and in particular, so over here, if you look, the other multi-frame size is 51 multi-frames. So here's 51 TDMA frames that come together. Here's 26. And both of these are put in either 26 51 frames or 51 26 frame slots into a super frame here. Now, it seems very strange because what they should have done would be pick 52 frame, right? Because that somehow divide 26 times 2 would be 52. But they didn't do that. And they didn't do that very particularly because they want, wanted to have a lack of um, kind of periodic structure here. So if you look here, you can see like at any point in time, right, the beginning of this multi-frame here, right now it occurs right here at the beginning of um, multi-frame zero. Over here, it occurs at the end of multi-frame one. Here it occurs at the end of multi-frame three and so on. And so what happens is that there's going to be control information that's contained in all of these different bursts here. And if they come periodically, you would be busy like decoding your signal and never have a chance to look at it. So if it comes aperiodically, that means that at some point in this six seconds, you'll have the chance to see that information because this information is repeated. I don't know if that makes any sense, but, but essentially it's done for a very specific reason. It's not kind of by accident. And, and every, every number in here, every feature of the standard, keep in mind was was discussed, was ratified, was discussed again, was simulated, was discussed further, was voted on. So, you know, everything here, every sentence in, in this, you know, thousands and thousands of pages was, was debated in detail here. So, it's one thing I've learned is that, you know, never just take anything for granted here. You know, everything has got a, a meaning. Okay, so that's the um, sort of the high-level structure here. So, essentially, um, 
Yeah, let's now talk about these different um, structures of the, the bursts here. So what this is, is so in class, a lot of times when we're talking about sort of a, a standard non-OFDM kind of waveform, QAM waveform, we have this at least in our mind that there's training at the beginning and then there's some data. And then, you know, in the lab you do that of training and data and then you repeat again, there's more training and there's more data. So the structure with GSM is um, slightly more complicated than that. And so there's different what they call bursts that correspond to different communication settings. So the first one is the normal burst. This is the one that's sent most often here. So this one contains, they all contain 100 and, um, what is it, 156.25 symbol periods. What this has is 58 encrypted bits, a training sequ sequence of length 26 bits, Bits and GSM sends only one bit per symbol, so a bit is the same as a symbol here. And then 58 bits here. So the main data or payload that's in a normal burst is going to be 58 plus 58, so that's 116 bits of, you know, data that could be speech or other information. Now there's also this training sequence here of length 26. So, you know, we use, I don't know what we use in the lab, maybe length 16, 32. So they've chosen length 26, and I'll comment more specifically on that in a minute here. So why is the training in the middle? Anyone take a guess here why it's not at the beginning, why it's in the middle? It's not there by chance. So why is it not at the end, even? So think about this here. This system is designed to work with um, very high mobility. This is designed to work on high-speed trains, you know, several hundred kilometers per hour. What can happen at very extreme levels of mobility is that the channel, which we always assume to be linear time invariant system, that's just an assumption. The channel starts to change. And so if you had the training here, and you looked at the channel between here and here, the maximum time under which it could change would be corresponding to basically 58 or 116 bit periods here. But if you have the training in the middle here, it can only have changed, you know, 58 bits worth here, 58 bits worth here. So you actually have halved the amount of time over which the channel can change. So you're just giving it less time to change. And the fact that the, tra the channel estimates in the middle here um, you know, you can still use that estimate to decode these data and this data. You're buffering it anyway. So it's not like there's a real-time thing where we decode the data, decode the training, and then we decode the data. I mean, you, you're, you're storing a whole waveform. So you can, you know, estimate the channel, then go back and decode the data. So that's um, why the training here is in the middle, because of the high mobility, and so you're exposing um, less of the, the packet to time variation. And so this, this concept will be a little bit more clear when we talk about coherence time. That's something we do in the next couple uh, weeks. So the training is there in the middle for some specific reason. Let's look at some of the other features here. So this TB here, it's not a disease. It's, um, it's essentially, actually, what does TB stand for? It's not, it's, what's that? Tail bits, yeah. So I was thinking like time burst here. So tail bits here, um, it, essentially, it can be used to uh, initialize the memory in the encoder here. So there's um, the bits here, encrypted bits are going to be uh, encoded. And so the tail bits can be used to initialize the states of the encoder and it can also be used for decoding. So that's tail bits here. Then there's also this over here, GP. And notice that there's a 0.25 here. So that's where the quarter bit comes in, and GP is guard period. And so this is a bit of slack time that allows for um, slight differences in time of arrival of the different um, frames here on the uplink of these different bursts here. So this is like a normal burst. This is the one that, you know, the receiver would mostly be processing is, is the normal burst here. 
Now, that's um, kind of like the verse that's close, most closely related to what we do in, in class here. Now, we'll talk about, towards the end of the lecture, how the modulation actually works here. So it's not quite QPSK, QAM. It's a different modulation. So we'll talk about that at, at the end of class here. But this whole sequence of bits here is modulated and then sent and um, you know, demodulated at the receiver. Now, so there's three other uh, bursts that are interesting here. This first one here is called the frequency correction burst. Now, this is a place where the GSM standard and the structure they've put in differs than what we've talked about in class. So what we talked about in class was this really cool periodic structure that lets us do correlation and find the frequency offset. GSM, they, um, for various reasons, decided not to use that kind of a structure. They did something that's actually slightly easier, which is have created this frequency correction burst, which essentially consists of a whole bunch of ones in a row. It turns out, because of the modulation that is used in GSM, that if you have a, a sequence of 142 ones, that, that converts into effectively just a sinusoid. So this frequency correction burst, what it is, is, is essentially some stuff here and then a sinusoid, <laughs> and then a whole bunch of stuff here. And then if you remember, um, you know, if we think about the... you know, the basics of signals and systems here, right? I mean, if you put in, put a sinusoid into an LTI system, you get out that sinusoid, right? Actually, if this is continuous time, I should put a H of F here, E to J, 2 pi, F of T. So it turns out here, effectively, by having a, a sinusoid, then um, from the perspective of frequency offset, right, what, what we're going to get at the output is we're going to get H of the sinusoid. So the sinusoid is happening at the carrier frequency plus some offset. And, what you, and then that's going to be multiplied by E to the J 2 pi carrier frequency plus the offset times T, and then times this, you know, something like this here. So you demodulate, well, you, yeah, sorry. I mean, it's basically, you'll end up with something like, yeah, e to the j, 2 pi times this frequency here plus, plus the frequency offset. So I've not drawn that very well here. Let me just write that like this here. something like this here. And so the idea is that you know what frequency you're sending. This is a complex number, has some amplitude, doesn't matter. And then this is another shift here. So when you look in the frequency domain, you know, you're expecting to see your signal lying over here at, let's say, FC, and then it ends up being at FC plus F of E. And so you can use some frequency domain signal processing techniques to estimate that carrier frequency, determine that error, and subtract it out. So that's, that's like at a high level what happens. Now, there is um, a bit of work that goes into the, the signal processing algorithm. It's not quite that you look at this and you take the FFT. You actually need to do something that's more precise because you need better resolution than that. And it's possible. But anyways, the point here is that is the structure. And so a main um, difference between what we studied in class and what GSM does is GSM essentially sends a little piece of a sinusoid so that you can estimate the offset. So that, that's like the main point here. Any questions on that here? Now, let's, let's talk about um, some of the other functions. So for example, um, so GSM is not using 
that periodic structure to do frame synchronization. So when you first turn your phone on, you know, how do you determine where the burst is or the frame or the multi-frame or any of that, you know? So there's got to be some structure in there. So um, every, the way the, there, there's a broadcast control channel. So the base station is on one of its frequencies broadcasting all the time a sequence of information that um, is occurring periodically. And that includes a frequency correction burst, a synchronization burst, and other information related to this is the base station identifier, this is the kind of frequency hopping strategy we're using, these are the, you know, if you want to do random access, this is where you should go. So the synchronization burst and frequency correction burst come together. What a synchronization burst has that's interesting is it has a um, very long training sequence here of a length 64. And then it has less information, but 39 encrypted bits here. So this information here relates to this base station identifier and other basic information about the base station. And then it has a, this very long uh, correlation sequence here. So what you can do is you can essentially look for a sinusoid, correct the offset, and then look for this correlation, because they kind of come one after the other here. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially the idea here. So it's like instead of um, doing a self-correlation, you're doing some kind of a correlation to get a sinusoid, fix the offset, and then doing a correlation to look for a peak here. And so you can sort of imagine running these two little algorithms in parallel, just like what we do with the Moose algorithm, except it's not quite a self-correlation, it's something else. And this synchronization sequence is longer so that... Um, you're, you have a better estimate of the channel, and you can also get a better estimate of, you know, when, when that information is arriving at your phone there. Now, there's one final problem that we haven't really dealt with here, which is the propagation delay. Now, propagation delay, normally we neglect, right? We put it into the channel or whatever. I mean, just, you know, it's just not something that we've been doing in the lab here. But if you think about it here, there... Um, in the cellular system, so we have our base station here, we're going to have the situation where there are two mobile stations communicating. You know, this one here is at distance D1, this is at distance D2 here. Now, you know, the base station sends information using this framing structure, right? So there's a whole periodic set of bursts here. What happens is there's a propagation delay associated with this small distance here. So this mobile station hears the frames starting here, and so on. And this guy hears the frames starting way over here. And so what happens is if these guys each say, ah, well, that must be when the frame starts, and so then they send their uplink data at that same time. That uplink data arrives even later, right? Double the round trip propagation time here. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. But remember this, let's say, I guess probably no one in here knows, oh, a few of you know what a foot is. That's good. Um, let's say th light travels three nanoseconds per meter. Um, so, you know, let's see, 1,000 feet is one microsecond. Well, I'm going to work in feet, sorry. So 1,000 feet is a, is a microsecond here. 1,000 feet is not, not very far. So 1,000 na thousand nanoseconds, one microsecond here. Let's go back over here and see. Oh. A symbol duration is 3.69 microseconds. So that corresponds to about a 3,000, like, you know, less than one mile, half mile, so roughly a kilometer of... Um, propagation delay. GSM is designed to work in cells of up to 20 kilometers wide. So that's 40 kilometers worth of propagation delay. This is roughly only one here. So what can happen is that, um, you know, you can end up with um, 40 microseconds of delay and the whole time slot itself, I mean, this is, the whole time slot itself is about, um, 
half a millisecond here. So you could end up with a substantial amount of overlap between the time slots. You know, and if you're sending on one time slot and it collides with someone else's time slot, they're basically both not decodable here. So when you first get on the cellular system, there's a procedure that's done called ranging, where you send information, and the base station estimates the total time of flight here. So let's call it like, like whatever, two delta here, because you don't know how long it took the signal to get to you. You don't know how long it goes back. But the base station knows when it sent it to you. And so it can estimate that delta. Now let's go back here and look right here. So this is the burst that you use to do that. The guard period here is 38 um, microseconds. And I have, OK, this calculation here, this corresponds roughly to the round trip time from the base station to a user 30 kilometers away. So that's a 60 kilometer round trip time here. And so what happens is this is just a huge guard period. So after you have found the frequency offset synchronization, and then frequency correction and the synchronization burst. You've decoded information about the base station. Base station will tell you where you can send your access burst to register and to get onto the cellular network. And so there'll be a certain time, there'll be a certain uplink, you know, time slot and frame where it says, okay, you know, mobile station, you can send here, or it just says that anybody who needs access, you know, here's the random access opportunities. And so you'll send information there and then using the ranging, the base station can essentially estimate, based on when it receives your synchronization sequence, what that delay was. And then it'll report that delay to the mobile user. And so this encrypted bits consists essentially of information relating to the mobile station. The um, depends on how long you've been off the network, but it might have, yeah, related to the temporary mobile subscriber or other information. So this contains, like, you can think about this like your phone number, let's say. And then this is synchronization sequence. So the base station figures out roughly where you are, and then it tells you, you know, when you talk to me, be sure to subtract off, you know, two delta from what you say. And so that's done on the access burst here. And so that's kind of a cool feature that we really haven't talked at all about in the class. But because people are sharing the spectrum, you have to share, share it in a nice way. Now, what about frequency? What if the mobiles are transmitting at different frequencies, but they're all supposed to be sending on the same frequency? What would happen? So if I send, you know, if one mobile sends at some frequency here, another one sends at a different frequency here, another one at a different frequency here. Well, they don't, con they don't collide with each other, but they could end up, you know, smearing potentially into other spectrum. And so what happens is all the mobiles, before they send information, they estimate the frequency offset from the frequency correction burst, and they use that correction on their transmissions as well. So, you know, in class, we talked about only doing the frequency offset correction of the receiver. So in the cellular system, though, you also have a pre-correction at the transmitter so that the base station doesn't have to correct your frequency offset because this, this burst here is only sent by the base station. It's never sent by the mobile station. So the base station could use some complicated signal processing algorithm, or it could just tell everybody, you know, you synchronize to me. It's kind of like the master-slave uh, relationship here. So the base station tells everybody, you know, when to send, make sure you've corrected your offset, you know, and here's where you get to send to me here. So that's kind of the high-level structure, which I find interesting. Um, Any questions on the structure? So I'm going to talk about the training sequences now. Uh, I think I'm going to talk about the training. Okay, so then this is not in the standard. Um, I mean, it's not in this document. It's in a different document. Um, so the there are eight total training sequences that are used in the standard. There's also eight bursts per TDMA frame. 
So you can use one different one per burst. It turns out that, so if we go through here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, draw a line like this here. You go over here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Draw a line like this here. If we look at, look at the symbols, look at the bits that are here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are repeated here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are repeated here. So it turns out that these training sequences were designed with, one, good correlation property. In fact, good, um, let's see, good partially periodic correlation and good cross -correl low cross-correlation. So if you cross-correlate, you know, this training sequence with that one, you know, the output of that's going to be low. Now, it has these little extra um, periodic extensions here because GSM is designed to work with multipath channels that have actually up, up to L equal 4. Now, this is not quite true because there's a combination of partial response and multipath, but essentially it's designed to be able to equalize um, up to L equals 5. And so if you take this training sequence here, and then you convolve it with a length 5 channel, right? So you're going to get some smearing, and then in the middle of it there, you're going to have a bit of this, um, uh, what looks like a, like a circular convolution. And then what you can do is you can correlate with the inner piece of this and still get a good correlation peak. So it, it was designed essentially to have good correlation properties in channels of length up to 6 total, L equals 5. And then it has low cross-correlation properties because the, um, the training sequences are allocated differently in different cells. So the neighboring cell, which might also be using time slot 1 on your same carrier, will have a different training sequence so that that training doesn't corrupt your estimate of the channel. And it helps you get a better estimate of your channel and helps you better decode your own signal here. Now, um, th there's a lot more to this story here because th these are bits, but these bits are actually modulated in the GSM waveform. And even in the GSM waveform, they have good um, low, low, good autocorrelation, low cross-correlation properties. But it's kind of cool because they have the cyclic prefix and postfix and the correlation and the cross-correlation here. So it's very, very carefully designed sequence, not a randomly chosen sequence at all. And not, certainly not a randomly chosen length 26 sequence. All right, I'm just trying to find the other things I wanted to mention here. Let's see. Let's go. Oh, it's here. Ha. Huh. Yeah, so just something I wanted to mention. You know, conceptually, I'm telling you that you're assigned a, uh, a frequency and a time slot, but there's actually frequency hopping that's used, so you would be assigned um, a sequence of frequencies to use. So, so slot one in, you know, in that first multi-frame might occur on one frequency. Slot, the second slot one will occur at a different frequency and so on. And this is used as a way of interference averaging and also adds, adds an element of security. Um, coding and interleaving. Ooh. I'm going to skip the details of all of that here. The main um, picture that you, know, you should have in your mind here just related to the, the coding is that, um, so think about the picture that we had drawn the second lecture in class, digital communication system background, there was encryption, there was application layer, there's all of that here. So this is like the picture of how it looks in um, the GSM system here. And so here's, let's work backwards here. Antenna, you know, transceiver, here's the modulator. That's good news. 
there is a differential encoder here. I'll explain why that's here. That's um, actually here because of the type of modulation that's used. Burst multiplexing, burst building. This is essentially just a block that maps the data into this hierarchy. You know, it's something that, that is, that we should probably talk about, but we don't usually talk about specifically in the lecture here. And then here is cryptological unit. So the encryption here is actually applied after the encoding. And then this is all the encoding. Interleaving, reordering, convolutional coding, block coding, information bits. So the, all the information is error control coding, all that's applied, possible encryption, and then passed into um, the, essentially the modulator here. And so the GSM uses a combination of block and convolutional codes to, to help protect for, against errors. And it actually uses um, unequal error protection. So the speech data can be partitioned into higher priority bits and lower priority bits. So the higher priority ones are, are um, encoded with uh, more error protection than the low priority ones. And so that, in that way, if you lose something, you lose the lower priority ones, which results in some voice distortion, but doesn't result in completely garbled communication. All right, so I'll skip the other details there. So the last thing I want to talk about is the modulation structure. I'll pause again here for questions. So, so I'm going to remind everyone, so, some of you came in late, that there's no um, text that goes with this um, part of the lecture. So, I mean, I, I strongly encourage you to ask some question if something isn't clear. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, a, a topic that is, is very immense here. But if, if you're not seeing the point or, you know, it's good to ask now. So that there's no, you know, mismatch between what I expect that you've learned and what you actually learned. And we can wait till midterm or the final, but that's um, a bit unfortunate. <laughs> so no questions here? No questions at all? Okay. What is that phrase? You dig your own grave? All right. Try not to be too morbid. Um, all right, the final thing I want to tell you a little bit about is just the modulation structure. And so we're going to look at um, GSM. This is originally 5.04. Okay, so I'm going to actually work backwards in the description here. Okay, so this is the formula for the um, passband signal that we send using GSM here. So the things to note here. First of all, you know, what we were talking about before, there was like um, an amplitude function and a phase function. And we decomposed that into something that was a function of a sine and a cosine. And we got a quadrature term. It, GMSK, GSM uses this GMSK Gaussian minimum shift keying. It's a type of modulation that only tries to modify the phase. So there's only, there's a phase function here, but there's no amplitude. There's a random phase component here. That's um, unknown that we haven't been considering. We are, or we've been including that essentially in the channel. And there's also a 2 e sub EC over T here. The only kind of new thing here is this 2. The 2 is used here because um, GMSK is sending only one bit, so it actually can put twice the power in the, um, the bit that it has. It's not splitting it over real and complex. Okay, so how do we get that? phase function. Well, how we get that phase function is um, as follows here. So that phase function is a linear combination of AI. This is like our SN. That's our symbols. That's a sequence of bits modulated in BPSK formats. That's 1 and minus 1. Then there's some scaling functions. And then there's a funny, funny, funny looking pulse shape here. Instead of a pulse shaping function, we have this integral of a pulse shaping function here which is sort of weird. 
The reason that's there, though, is that it makes this phase function very smooth here. And, and so by having a very smooth phase, we can control the um, bandwidth of the signal. This is all, these are all facts that are related to nonlinear modulations that we haven't talked about in class. But um, so anyways, it, it does look sort of like what we looked at in class, except for that weird phase function. And, that, and then you might be wondering, where does the Gaussian come in? Well, that phase function is rather intuitively the convolution between a Gaussian function, which is described down here, which has a variance delta of t, which is the square root of the log divided by 2 pi, b is the bandwidth times the symbol period. It's called the bt product, and for GMSK, it's equal to 0.3. So if you ever look at a GMSK modulation, you have to specify the bt product. So that's here. It's basically the variance of the Gaussian. It turns out that that pulse shape is the convolution between a rectangle function and the Gaussian, and that is integrated to create that right there. And uh, the bits prior to actual encoding are differentially encoded, which means that the current bit and the previous bit are added together in binary. And that's actually the information that's converted to BPSK. So. To summarize, your, your data comes in. It's differentially encoded, starting with um, initializing at, at 1 here. Actually, the tail bits are 0, so it should be initialized at 0. And then you convert those bits to BPSK, and you take that, and you pass it into a phase modulator that just does sort of like what we do in class, the, the linear combination of A and something, except that, that we haven't a weird integral of a pulse shape here, and that becomes the phase function here. So this is an example of, of a nonlinear modulation technique. Now, one in really interesting fact is that it turns out that you can apply a mathematical technique to the GMSK waveform, and you can convert it into a QPSK-like waveform using some approximation, and, and, and it is really cool. And so you can actually rewrite this whole thing, and, that, and it turns out that, in my opinion, that's why the, the differential is here, because, it, because when you do that linearization, this actually disappears. Differential encoding goes away, believe it or not. So you, bet you end up with a, a QPSK type of waveform that looks, it'll look something like this here. It'll look something like sum over K, j to the k, complex number j, s of k being our symbol. And then I don't want to use g here, g, k, m, q. Let's call it q. q of t minus k t here. So you'll end up with some modulated signal that looks like this, where this q is a, um, is a pulse shaping function that's derived in some bizarre way from this integral of this convoluted Gaussian. And there's a weird uh, j to the k that shows up in there. And this s is actually the, the information here, the non-differentially encoded information. So it turns out that you can actually linearize GMSK, and then you can use all the tricks that we've talked about in class. Oh, the other thing is that this is nowhere near a Nyquist pulse shape. So you introduce a fair amount of intersimilar interference that you have to equalize. And so there's... Um, so two, I think this thing effectively introduces two symbols worth of inner symbol interference, and the channel introduces three, and that's what we that's how we get the five, if I remember correctly here. So, yeah, I spent the um, first summer when I started my PhD, I had to build a, a GMSK, a G, actually it's a GSM space-time receiver. And someone else was doing the hardware, and I was doing all of the software. And uh, I really got to know this, this modulation very well. 
and, and believe me, you, you know, you should you should all be thanking me for not teaching two lectures on it. It's it's incredibly painful, and it would be even worse if you had to do it in the lab, because this weird partial response and the and the deconvolving all of these different pulse shapes. Um, but it's elegant. Now you might be wondering why on earth do we pick this modulation technique? I mean, it's confusing to explain. It's complicated to equalize. The reason is that it has, um, first of all, constant envelope property. So the output, there, there's, um, there's no amplitude variation, because all you're doing is tweaking the phase of a sinusoid. So that's very good from an RF perspective. The other benefit is that um, the spectrum is, is actually is very tight. And so the, they've picked the BT product such that the spectrum is, is very, very good. But it's mainly the constant envelope property. And so that means that you can have a... Um, a very crappy amplifier operating in the nonlinear region, and it still works. And if you remember, well, none of you remember this because some of you weren't born then, but in the first GMS, uh, GSM phones that came out, they were small. I mean, the CDMA phones didn't get that small until like the late 90s. I mean, they were super small because the whole system was designed to be very, very efficient. It was designed to be very power efficient, to use very low complexity to make the battery life extremely long. And so all of these decisions were made, you know, they weren't made for the convenience of us, the signal processing engineer, they were made for the convenience of our friends that were doing the analog and the mixed signal. And that they could get away with much less efficient power amplifiers that, actually I should say much more efficient power amplifiers that were, um, had, had, you know, more phase noise and more nonlinearity than current, current approaches. So that's why they, they chose it. And then it just happens to be a fortunate, I think, a fortunate coincidence that you can linearize it and use the concepts that we talked about in class to do this here. And so I have actually built this whole radio, and it does work. You know, when you get everything all tidied up, it does actually, you know, work like this, interestingly enough. What's that? No, well, no, this... this APSK is the other version here, which I didn't talk about. But uh, that one, yeah, this, this one, what they've done with um, Edge is that yeah, they tr they they took. Mm -hmm. They took the linearized GMSK and modified it to use 8PSK. So this is sort of a, I mean, I'm trying not to show this here, but yeah, basically this is the, the, the pulse shaping formula. These pulse shapes are, I don't know where to get started there. Anyways, <laughs> it looks like this here, where this is 8PSK, and this is a fun-looking pulse shape that just consists of the products of shifted versions of integrals of sines stuff here. And actually this all comes from, it, it turns out it comes from something like a Taylor series expansion of a, a certain function. So it, it actually all, it all does make incredible amount of sense. Once you've read several papers and have done this derivation here, yeah. Doesn't, it won't take three years to do it, but it would take, um, it would probably take two weeks to go through this in detail. Yeah, last year I gave a great homework problem where everyone had to re-derive all of this. Oh, it was nice. It's really nice. Not sure. Uh, I don't think so. Well, actually, though, I walked everyone through the steps. So it wasn't like, you know, derive this. It was, you know, it was expand this, simplify this. It was, it was actually easy to do, just time-consuming. But yeah, that's uh, that's the modulation technique here. So I guess I mean to to summarize the, you know the the things to take away from the lecture here. I mean, from a signal processing perspective, the structure in that waveform, you know that that hierarchical structure, the different bursts, what, why those bursts are there, what features they have that are relevant from a signal processing perspective. So. The normal burst had the training in the middle. 
you know, the access burst had that big guard period. The synchronization burst had a long training sequence. Frequency correction burst was a sinusoid. You know, so th these are things to be able to know, to be able to articulate on a homework or midterm exam. And then um, a little bit about this GMSK modulation in particular, you know, how we create the modulated signal. Even though there's a whole bunch of equations there, I mean, the actual way to create it is not, you know, this here is not that hard to understand. And this is actually not that hard to understand if you just, you know, go with the flow here <laughs> with what that is. It's actually just a, a, shift, of pul a shift of pulse shapes. So... I think those are the important takeaways here. So any questions, other questions on GMSK or GSM or anything related to GSM? Oh, I mean, it, okay, it, essentially, you can, you can write this as the real part of something that looks like this, e to the j, um, phi of t, right? That, so that's like, um, sorry, e to the j phi of t times the e to the j 2 pi f naught of t, you know? So that's the usual, like, complex baseband. So the complex baseband equivalent of the, the GMSK signal is like e to the phi of t here. So... That's an exponential function, so you can apply, it's not exactly a Taylor series expansion, but essentially one can apply an, a mathematical expansion to this term here and can get something that ends up looking like, like this here with a whole bunch of other stuff there. So you don't need to do that. But that's where it comes from. I mean, it comes from um, a yeah, paper by this guy named Laurent, and it's, it's just a particular framework for representing continuous phase modulated signals using linear um, modulations. Because the extension uses APSK, so instead of sending a BPSK signal, the edge also uses an 8PSK signal. And so the symbol here, instead of being BPSK, becomes 8PSK. So the modulating 8PSK symbols, blah, 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 blah. So that's, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, look at this here. They're represented by Dirac pulses exciting a linear pulse shaping filter. That's exactly the first part of the class that we did here. So these are 8PSK here. And so they did this because... They wanted to add higher data rates to GSM, but they didn't really want to change too much of the waveform because they wanted to keep all of those other nice properties of the analog signal. And so they, they figured out a way to introduce extra phase levels to, to send more information. And that makes the waveform, um, you know, a little, a little bit... Um, actually, I don't, actually, I think it still should be pretty smooth, but you can get more information there at the expense of needing a higher SNR to decode that information. So, so on your phone, if you ever see E on your phone, E is edge, and that means that you're using, your you've, phone has gone back to using this 8PSK version here. Yeah, which is why it's so slow, exactly. You get, you know, just, a, just 14 kilobits per second, or up to 300 and something, but typically less than that. All right, well, that is it here. What's that? Say that the sheet you will get from the next ETSL. Yeah, I gave you two of them.